Great. Well, why don't we get started? Because we only have an hour today and we have an amazing panel uh, that will focus on AI ethics and uh, will also reflect on some of the video courses that they've shared. As mentioned, I'm Stefan Verhulst. I'm the co-founder of GovLab uh, in New York City. And I'm also one of the course leads of AI Ethics Global Perspectives. Next slide, please. The course is an initiative uh, from the GovLab, but also in close collaboration with the Global Consortium on AI Ethics and with the Center for Responsible AI at New York University, but also with one of our core partners, which is the Institute for AI Ethics in, uh, at the Technical University of Munich. And the whole idea behind the course is to deconstruct AI ethics from a variety of perspectives and a variety of cultures. AI ethics is an emerging field that really touches on a variety of aspects, whether it's around the use of data or whether it's around applications in a particular kind of context, such as healthcare, for instance, but also it touches on new notions on how, for instance, we can approach AI from existing philosophical traditions or traditions that have a different cultural distinctive nature as well. And so what we try to do with the AI ethics course is to really broaden our perspective and really have a conversation among different actors that bring different pieces to the puzzle of AI ethics. And today uh, we are delighted to have four uh, faculty that have shared their video last month or the month before, because every month we are releasing uh, three or four new videos that are freely available for everyone to watch. And the collection ultimately is meant to provide this kind of comparative perspectives and global perspectives on uh, what AI ethics could mean and what are the implications as it relates to the further development of AI and data as well. And as I mentioned, Today, I'm delighted to be here with uh, four distinguished uh, faculty that have shared their video. And for those who have not watched it, uh, you can go on the AI Ethics uh, website afterwards as well. But uh, let me briefly introduce uh, who we have today and then get us started. Because as I mentioned, uh, we only have a few uh, moments or an hour or so to really reflect on uh, what has been uh, mentioned as well. And so we have today Janchu Kancha, or I probably mispronounced it, Janchu Kancha, there we go. Uh, I mean, I, I did practice beforehand, but again, I still made a mistake, uh, who is uh, founder and director of the AI Ethics Lab in uh, Cambridge and also has an affiliation with uh, Northeastern University. Then we have uh, Javier Camacho Ibanez, uh, who is Director of Ethical Sustainability at ICADE at uh, Comillas uh, University in Madrid. And uh, ICADE is the business school. And then we have also his colleague, uh, Jose Luis uh, Fernandez Fernandez, who is a professor also at ICADE at Comillas uh, University based in Madrid. And then obviously we also have Nuria Oliver. Uh, this is becoming very much a Spanish undertaking here today. Uh, who is the scientific uh, director and co-founder at the Ellis Alicante Foundation um, in, um, in Spain. And, um, uh, and yeah, I saw Harris joining us as well, but uh, not sure whether he actually will also be able to join us because of a variety of personal uh, reasons. But that's the panel for today. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, what I would like to do is to really uh, reflect on some of the core messages that everyone has developed in their video. And then I will open up uh, the floor. So if you have a question uh, to one or more of the panelists, feel free to add it to the Q&A. Ideally, also indicate who you pose the question to, and then I will come back uh, to your questions either during uh, some of the sessions or when we actually have our dedicated Q and A, but let me start it by with, uh, and here we go again, Jansu Jancha. Uh, so I just got to say Jansu if that's okay with you. Um, uh, and uh, and so Jansu, you anyway are leading the AI Ethics Lab, and in your video which you shared uh, with all of us uh, on our AI Ethics panel, 
um, you introduced um, a very interesting model, uh, which obviously uh, you call the pie model. And so why don't we get started uh, with uh, perhaps a reflection on what's the pie model? Why should we care? And then more importantly, how does it relate with AI ethics, which obviously is the topic of today and the topic of our, our course as well. So over to you, uh, John Su. Thank you, Stefan. So um, the PI model is the, the longer version of the name is the puzzle solving and ethics model. Um, and the idea there is that taking ethics, like the practitioners, not philosophers, but the practitioners have this view of ethics as something that is compliance and yes or no, you know, like you go through certain questions and or the ethics review board goes through certain questions and they either say, okay, approved or not approved. So it's sort of like this um, very strict, rigid structure, a hurdle to be passed. The puzzle solving and ethics model, on the other hand, is trying to take, take, it, take ethics out of that rigidity and bring it to innovation in a much more collaborative and dynamic way. Um, so what we do is to create a structure within companies, which, within organizations, universities, um, that allows ethics to run alongside of the uh, projects that allows proper ethics analysis. So go, going beyond rule of thumb, but um, allowing ethics experts to work together closely with the developers, uh, deployers of AI systems, and not just telling them what goes wrong or what can go wrong, or what is ethically not okay, but working together with them to create solutions. So these can be mitigation solutions with like regular safeguards and so on, but it could also be very much like design solutions, looking at how we can fix the model or fix the data or fix the tool, the, the user interface of the tool so that we allow whatever ethical concern we have to be incorporated into the um, AI system. Um, that's the, the, the brief description. There are, there are three main components of the uh, PI model. So, um, well, actually four main components. Um, the, the main thing I, that I, like the, my, the thinking starts is like, how would you allow the um, ethics analysis to become a part of the project? So that's where we do the ethics analysis. So we, have, we created tools for that and um, uh, ways of um, sharing the work. So what can developers do in terms of checking their systems for their ethical um, weaknesses and what can the ethics experts come in to help? Um, so the ethics analysis is sort of like the core of the whole model. Uh, what we want to do for every project, every product, product that goes through the, um, you know, the, the, the organization. Um, every product that could be procured as well, by the way, just don't think about the development deployment uh, and runs alongside, as I said, throughout the whole um, AI lifecycle. Um, but to do this properly, of course, we need to, um, again, we are not thinking about ethics coming from like on top down. So we want to make sure that the organization has skills. So we have training section where we created workshops, interactive workshops and seminar materials where we um, help non-philosophers think through ethics and, and, and see how their expertise come into play. And finally, a big chunk of it is the strategy um, where we want to be, uh, where we want to make sure that we can put in place systems, guidelines, tools, um, organizational structures, so that what I just said becomes a common practice. You don't discover the uh, wheel from the start every time you get a new project, but you have actually guidelines to help you. You have tools to help you. You know who to reach out when there is a uh, question, and and usually. All of this starts with when we meet with the organization by uh, creating a roadmap, looking at what they do. So we figure out what to prioritize first and start building the structure from then on. Um, I developed the PI model in 2018. So we've been practicing, we've been implementing it since then. And as you mentioned, uh, so in addition to running AI Ethics Lab, I also am the ethics leader of, uh, at Northeastern University's Institute for Experiential AI and I'm a research associate professor um, at Northeastern. Um, we are, our responsible AI practice at the Institute is also modeled on the PI model. Thanks so much, uh, John Suru. And, um, and 
Tell me a little bit more about, I mean, I think the Pi model is very interesting because it does go beyond this kind of uh, binary kind of decision. It's really more about, anyway, how do we design uh, a, a responsible ethical approach across the, day, uh, the AI lifecycle? Um, but tell me a little bit about what are some of the trigger points that you feel across the AI lifecycle require an ethical uh, assessment? Because quite often, anyway, Sometimes it's start anyway. It's at the beginning. We have those trigger points. Either whether you anyway submit a proposal or whether anyway you get some funding. But then anyway, then suddenly there's no reflection anymore on whether actually there are some ethical concerns in different stages of the life cycle. And so wonder how you, know, you see those trigger points and uh, and how you embed them in actually the roadmap as you uh, explained. So I'll start with the wrong answers. <laughs> So it is not at the very end of the project or product development right before you release the product. That is not when you should um, start your ethics journey. <laughs> um, that is for, for any uh, team or organization, that is the most costly time to do it. Because when we discover problems, which we often do, then you have too little time to fix and there's too much already invested into the, the structure that you have created. So definitely not right before release or right after release, obviously. Um, also, definitely not just before you start the project and then forget about it. That is not also how you do it, because it, 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 um, understandably, as you develop the project, new questions will arise, you will tweak the um, model, you will tweak the data, maybe you will tweak the user interface project product de design. So if we just do it at the beginning and then get the approval and move on, we are unable to uh, engage with all of these ethical questions that arise uh, in those different stages. So the answer is like, we, we ideally, we want to start before you start the project. So with the conception of the project, we want uh, to start including ethics elements. Um, and again, to make this like not so um, costly and uh, time consuming, we, we we sort of alternate between those parts where we where we take our um, when we have to do sort of like deep dive versus where there are like quick checks. So one of the things we created, for example, is this um, tool called the box, where we have um, we have the core you know philosophical values of you know autonomy and uh, minimize harm, uh, justice, and then we attach those. Uh, principles, uh, core values to the instrumental principles of like privacy, transparency, and so on. Um, and what we give to um, developers or those who are starting the project, uh, researchers, is um, a way of, I mean, with this tool, we give them some ways of using it as well. Um, in a way, create like a self-check to see where is the weakness and what can be done. Um, and so, it starts like it alternates between the developers or the designers doing their self-check and then as they discover uh, problems or um, trade-offs that are that are complex uh, interacting with the ethics team ethics experts to figure out ways to solve them and then again you know go back to self-check and so on so we try to put in place a process that allows this um that allows us to happen dynamic and fast uh, because obviously one of the goals is not um, is to be efficient in what we do. Great, and um, um, I think there is a question already in the Q and A as well. There are a whole range of questions, but uh, one is um, particularly targeted to you, Jansu, with regard to whether there are particular kind of use cases where you've applied the uh, the Pi model. Um, mm -hmm. Was it in uh, anyway? And are there? I mean, question I have is: Is the Pi model more appropriate for particular kind of sectors, right? So one example, or one question was you know, using AI within the context of financial services as well. Yeah. And so wonder, or whether you use it mainly, for instance, within the more you know, scientific uh, uh, experimentation of using AI uh, as well. Uh, no, so the, the uh, well, yes and no. Yes, we have many uh, use cases. We, we have already worked with, um, we did work with financial sector, um, with um, workplace safety, telecommunication, um, the security system. Um, I can't give more details because most of our work is like heavily under NDA. <laughs> um, and the other thing is that it's definitely across um, 
across the um, across uh, sectors and also um, roles. So it's not directed towards the management position or it's not directed towards just the developers, mm -hmm. uh, but we try to make sure that whatever is necessary, or we don't, again, we don't want to overburden or overcomplicate things. We want to make sure there is just the right level of ethics engagement. Um, so we, we sort of like weave it into the organization by putting different components of Pi model um, to be engaged with, with the, by different, um, in different roles, by different teams. And this can be done in you know, public sector, private sector, all industries, um, researchers, and so on. Great. Sorry, thanks so, yeah, no, thanks so much, Jansu. And, and I do uh, will come back to you as well, because uh, you already mentioned that you want to do this in some kind of a lightweight anyway, fashion where it's not too burdensome, because one of the concerns quite often is, of course, is that it all adds uh, additional kind of burns and cost, right? And again, anyway, we can look at this from different uh, perspective. It's probably more costly if you actually have a problem afterwards to fix it. But at the exactly. same time, uh, um, there are some of those concerns as well. And I will come back to you on that topic um, once we gone through the, so you have some time to <laughs> reflect on that question uh, once we've gone through uh, the panel here. And so let me go to uh, Javier and uh, Jose, uh, Jose Luis. And, um, and so your uh, wonderful um, contribution to the AI ethics uh, course really focuses on the concept of moral agency. And so why don't we get started there with regard to A, what do you mean by moral agency? And more importantly, um, how does it uh, manifest itself uh, as it relates to AI technologies? And, and also, anyway, it's interesting that you both within a business school. So why should businesses care about that, right? And so over to you, meaning you're two. So I, I, I leave it up to you to coordinate amongst yourself on who will respond to that. Okay, thank you, thank you. I, I, I will try to respond to the question. Uh, well, um, I am Jose Luis. Uh, our, our approach is, is a complementary one of the one that our previous uh, colleague has uh, spoken. We are uh, putting the, the focus on the moral philosophy and not just on the moral good, moral good practice is the practice. And we are, are looking for a good practice, yes, of course. But perhaps one of the best practices, it, it starts with a good theory. Yeah? So philosophy can, can help to put some problems or some traits in, in, in inadequate perspectives. So we, we open the discussion of the moral agency is a very, very uh, um, uh, specific question of a very technical question in, in ontology and in, in philosophy. And um, the question is, the moral agent properly is a human person. So uh, me and you are moral agents. Uh, the question is why? Well, because we have a freedom of choices. Uh, do, we can choose to do this or that or, or, or not do anything at all. And we are intelligent. We have conscience. We are intelligent to, to, to calculate uh, what is possible to follow if I choose A or N. So we have natural intelligence, very weak, very fallible, very, uh, very small in comparison with the artificial intelligence that has a big capacity of, of uh, storage and computation and so. But we don't never forget that artificial intelligence is a product of human intelligence who is built by the natural intelligence. So this is something paradoxical, but it's important to take of this situation. And the, the, the thesis is from this point of view theoretical, 
the, the thesis is that, um, okay, artificial intelligence has the power, but the moral responsibility is not in the artificial intelligence, but in someone else. In what? In whom? In the person, in the human person. If this, if this is this way, so the, the question, the practical question is, we have to put the question, moral question, not, not only in the programmers and in the engineers, but above all in the industry uh, and businesses to develop this kind of products and services. And also we have to look for the help of global administration, a global administration who can help us to do what every one of us in this meeting and around the world are willing to find that this, that we can, we have, and we must put all this fantastic power at the service of humanity and put in person at the center of all the process. So this question, very, very abstract, ends up in a very practical proposal ethical Great. and gives us a regulator Think, around this. Great. Thanks so much, Jose. And and um, there were some issues with um, uh, bandwidth, but I think we got the uh, the gist of uh, what you were saying. And and perhaps Javier, you can um, uh, complement uh, Jose with regard to um, the issue of trust, uh, right? So we can anyway. Obviously, we can assume that agents uh, have a certain uh, moral responsibility. But at the same time, uh, uh, trust in those agents uh, needs to be established in order to then subsequently uh, have a trusted AI ecosystem. And so a topic in your uh, um, module actually goes about the issue of um, trusted uh, partnerships and how do you build trust between actors in the AI ecosystem. And perhaps uh, you can reflect a little bit about how you establish that or from your point of view. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, yeah, building up on, 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 on which, on the ideas from, from Jose Luis, or, or what he just explained, we believe that AI ethics can actually learn and can, uh, in this specific field, when we're talking about building trust, can take advantage of the advancements or the progress in business ethics. So we think that mm -hmm. AI ethics is kind of a, uh, would, would benefit a lot from from the business ethics field and then many theories around it. I mean, legitimacy theory, etc. The thing is that um, uh, one of the key one of the key issues is that it is true that artificial intelligence is kind of uh, mediating, uh, transforming some somehow this concept of moral agency between between two human agents or human and, and corporate agents. But even though this moral agency can be, you know, can be expanded, can be transformed, can be uh, highlighted some way, moral responsibility is not. Moral responsibility always lies so far with a, with a, with a human agent. Therefore, all the efforts that businesses have invested in developing the ethical dimension of the corporate culture can also be brought into the AI ethics and data governance uh, approaches to add, as, as Jens was saying, it's, it's actually very simple just to add this ethical dimension and, and some of the questions are related to that. How do I bring the ethical dimension into any product, any service that I develop? into the different procedures, into the different decisions that I took, that I make as a, as a company, right? So we think that, and, and, and uh, it, this is a little bit as an iceberg, 
or we, we like to, to use that example. So AFX is really the tip of the iceberg, but everything below, so the, the, the real important thing is the rest of things that companies have been working with for a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. Data governance, corporate culture, procedures, etc. Right. So we shouldn't we, we should not be blind by you know the hype on, on the tip of the iceberg, but but really reflect about that is transforming how we have to adapt our existing procedures, culture, etc. And I think that's that's the best way of building trust companies. Uh, still are thriving internally and externally to develop that trust with the different stakeholders, with internal stakeholders, with external stakeholders. And, and, and we just think that this is another, another flavor, another dimension, another color mm -hmm. that they need to bring into that. Mm -hmm. Great. And I will come back on that as well in a second, but uh, let me go uh, to Nuria and thanks Nuria for your patience uh, uh, because you know, sometimes, of course, there is a sequence and, uh, uh, and would be, and I'm sure you have some views on what other people have said as well. But let me um, go back to what you've shared with us and the AI ethics uh, course, which is really about how data and AI was used during COVID-19, right? COVID-19, obviously, it was like the massive natural experiment where we actually could really test out how we go about some of those ethical uh, aspects as relates to AI and data. And so, Nuria, from your point of view, what was the role of data ethics or AI ethics as it relates to the use of data science? And perhaps you can also reflect a little bit about what actually, anyway, uh, you, anyway, what your experience was, uh, especially in Valencia, uh, during the COVID and how data ethics uh, play the role. Thank you, Stefan. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, so there was definitely uh, a potential um, strong intersection between AI ethics or data ethics and the pandemic because um, this was the pandemic for which we had the largest amounts of data. And um, um, so the 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 aspiration is actually to be able to use that data to support better policy making, assuming that the data is a reflection of an underlying reality. So a lot of the challenges emerge from um, the use of the data. So what data, uh, are there privacy implications or not? How has the data been captured? Is it reflective of the underlying reality? Does it have any biases that could then lead to biased decisions, you know, and so forth. So there was a lot of um, uh, discussions about this. I was involved in an ethics committee that the Belgian government created at the beginning of the pandemic, um, when both in Belgium and also in Spain, we used large scale anonymized mobile data to better understand the mobility of the population because an infectious disease that is transmitted from human to human like coronavirus, doesn't become a pandemic if people don't move. So human mobility is key for the spread of the virus and for you know, a localized infection to actually become a pandemic. Um, so um, as you know, you know, in many countries in the world, you know, we were confined and we had you know, different levels of restrictions on mobility, which also raises ethical concerns because we didn't have autonomy anymore. Um, we didn't have, you know, freedom of movement and so forth. So there was also a big tension between uh, the invasion of individual rights uh, for the greater good and what that greater good, you know, could be. Um, but from the perspective of the data, it was important to understand if those measures were actually um, being complied with and also a, what impact they were having on the spread of the virus, because the purpose of these measures was to contain the spread of the disease. So it seems important to measure and understand if they were actually containing the spread of the disease. So in our particular case in Valencia, um, very early on, I led a multidisciplinary large team uh, of um, scientists, but also um, people with other backgrounds in the region. And a member of the team that came 
uh, to many meetings at the beginning was the chief data protection officer of the government, just to really have an understanding of, you know, what kind of data we're going to be using and what kind of um, a, a protections we had about the data, uh, if, if there were any potential privacy implications, if there were any potential biases in the data and so forth. Um, we also had um, perhaps an ethical dimension in the very large scale citizen survey that we launched. Um, in this case, it's a completely anonymous survey. There is no, uh, it's impossible to do any inference of any uh, personal attributes but it was more um, an ethical obligation that we felt we had to share um, all the answers from this large scale survey that became very popular with everybody. So we really pushed ourselves into uh, building visualizations that we updated very regularly. So not only policymakers, but also citizens, you know, could actually look at the results of the survey and have an understanding of the impact that the pandemic was having on people's lives because the purpose of the survey was to have a sensor of the impact of the pandemic on people's lives. There was a lot of ethical discussion on the use of digital contact tracing and uh, the potential privacy invasion implications, the potential misuse of the technology, the potential um, use for other purposes after the pandemic and so forth. Um, me personally, I was not a big advocate of digital contact tracing using a smartphone apps because uh, the underlying technology based on Bluetooth, I think was ill formed. I don't think it was the best solution for detecting proximity. And there were a lot of technical issues uh, uh, in terms of, you know, was there a wall in between the people, you know, where the people were in masks? I mean, there's so many unknowns, you know, just from getting that uh, proximity, you know, um, signal. So um, we actually proposed uh, alternative uh, options to that in a system that we call ACDC, where we were actually using humans to do the contact tracing, like people, like people know whom they have been in touch with. Uh, so if you test positive, you know, people could actually try to like spread sort of like the decentralized, you know, kind of crowdsource the contact tracing. So, and then of course, there were a lot of decisions, ethical implications, but we were not involved on those uh, related to the um, the management of the healthcare system and the allocation of beds and, and uh, ventilators and intensive care units and so forth in a situation where there might have been a scarcity, you know, of them. Oxygen, you know, we know the cases like in India where there was a big scarcity of oxygen and then how do you prioritize, you know, when you have too many sick people and you don't have enough resources. But fortunately, we, did, we were not, we were just, uh, uh, working on the data analysis, we were not involved in any kind of like the very, very difficult uh, decisions that I think had to be made during the pandemic. Sorry, I was muted. Thanks so much for that. And and yeah, I mean, as, as I said, I, mean, I think uh, COVID-19 was actually a really interesting um, um, exercise. And so from your point of view, well, not just an exercise, it was anyway, clearly a major pandemic, but but from your anyway, coming to the concept of exercise, how what, what have we learned that we can apply to future crisis uh, from your point of view, especially as it relates to how we embed ethics in those uh, development of and the use of AI or data? Is there anything that says, well, maybe given that we went through this, now we should do X <laughs> moving forward? Well, I mean, I think we learned more, I mean, I think to talk about AI ethics or data ethics, you need to have data and AI in right. the public administration. So yeah. I think we learned that they were very far away from the state of the art uh, in terms of being a data-driven organization and you know, much less so even an AI-driven organization. So most of the public administrations hadn't undergone the you know, a strong uh, digitization and, and sort of like um, transformation that most large companies, you know, had already undergone, you know, a decade ago. So I think the pandemic has served as a catalyzer and an accelerator for this necessary digitization because efforts like the one that we did in Valencia showed the value mm -hmm. if all these infrastructures and also talent and processes had been, you know, if they had been in place in, in the public administration. So I think they are a little, a little bit one step 
still behind, but also the, the, the opportunity is as they become more digital, as they become more data driven, as they create you know, data science teams you know, in the public administrations, um, um, they, they should, um, have as a core component, you know, the ethical dimension. They do have as a core component the data protection dimension because in Europe we have GDPR and you need to have, you know, a data protection officer. But I think something similar should happen in the context of ethics. Mm -hmm. In Europe, as you know, since April of 2021, the European Commission has proposed the AI Act, which is the regulation of AI and the use of AI in the public sector, um, well, depending on the use case, most certainly is going to be regulated. So I imagine that is going to go hand in hand with the deployment mm -hmm. of the AI Act. For example, right now, uh, one of the instruments that, um, that is related to the AI Act is the creation of an agency for the supervision of AI. And this agency uh, is both at the uh, European Commission level, but also at, at the level of the member states. And there is a lot of discussion right now in Spain, as we speak, as to where the AI um, uh, national agency for um, uh, AI supervision is going to be in Spain, because it has been announced by the government that it's the first time that a national agency is not going to be in Madrid. It's going to be decentralized in some other city that is not Madrid. And there are a lot of cities now that are applying to be the hosts of this AI supervision you know, agency that is going to be, I think, probably created by the end of this year. Um, so that's an example of uh, a clear sort of like AI ethics, I guess, uh, 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 agency. And I think the, the charter of this agency will be to uh, make sure that the uh, the companies and the institutions in the country are compliant with the AI Act and the AI regulation, which, uh, as you know, is based on risk of the risk that represents to people and society the use of AI in certain domains and use cases. And depending on the risk, the regulation is more or less intense, ranging from not very strong regulation or very mild, you know, simple regulation to prohibition uh, for cases where the European Commission considers that could have significant negative social impact. Great. Like immigration. Thanks so, yeah. Um, thanks so much. And uh, there are some questions also, but uh, we can perhaps come back to that, uh, Nuria, or, or you, perhaps you can share um, a link to some of the work you've done uh, to one of the questions that John has with regard to other uh, efforts uh, in measuring mobility during COVID-19. And, uh, and of course, you were involved in a variety of those. But I do want to also go back to uh, John Su, first of all, with anyway, my question on what's the perception here? Is this a burn or is it uh, an investment? But also there was a question from uh, Nas um, with regard to actually the level of capacity and sophistication uh, that uh, uh, is needed or anyway, he was just wondering, does it actually exist uh, um, in order to, for instance, apply the PI model, right? So it's great to have a methodology, but if you then have no capacity uh, within the organization to either apply it or what you also refer to, John Su, is actually it assumes that there is some kind of an ethical, uh, uh, a person with ethical expertise that can be called upon um, what's your sense on uh, state of capacity in that field? But also, anyway, my first question, of course, is anyway, and it's quite often related because if you do, if you see there's a cost, then you're not going to invest quite often in building that kind of capacity as well, right? And so, over to you, Jansu. Um, I, I actually really like how you uh, frame the question. So. Is it a cost or is it an investment? Because if, if you say is the cost um, or like what is the cost? Like obviously there, there is cost. Like I cannot sit, stand here and say, oh, it's just like we can this just go runs on the side. It's no time consume, no resources. No, of course not. You have to have um, you have to hire people. You have to train people. You have to give them time to be able to look at these uh, products or projects for ethics analysis. Um, but I think the correct way of thinking of this is investment because. Um, there are multiple ways. I mean, we all know like ethics, unfortunately, does not by itself motivate uh, humans or organizations to the sufficient level. So there has to be some extra motivation. The extra motivation in this case comes from, I think, two directions. One is 
the regulation is slowly building, as uh, Noria was explaining. But no matter how regulation, like how much regulation we have, there will always be a big chunk of gray area. We know this from medical ethics, for example. We have very elaborate medical law all around the world, but still there's a lot of unanswered questions where the ethicists are trying to uh, collaborate with physicians, public health uh, officials to figure those questions out. Um, so if you want to, as an organization, if you sort of want to be on the, um, either on the right side, ethically speaking, or on the right side of the ethic, uh, regulation, uh, re legally speaking, there is incentive to look at, start building on ethics already. The other one, the public perception, um, because more and more people care about the ethical aspects of the technology. So, um, you know, putting it very cynically, there is the PR uh, reputational benefits attached to uh, mm -hmm. ethics. And, as much as I would like everybody to do ethics for the right reasons, I think even these motivations, if they get you to get the organization to think about this um, adequately and not just do window dressing, that's great. Um, so yes, there's cost involved, but what we try to do is to minimize this cost. Um, and um, Naz's question is, yes, very relevant. Um, yeah, people, I mean, most of the, when I say ethics expertise, I really mean ethics expertise. I don't mean compliance expertise. So this is the problem that we always have, for example, with the institutional review boards or research ethics boards, where in the US, for example, there is no mandate to have even a single person who is, who is an ethicist, who is um, an expert in ethics to be on the board. And um, that's not an ethics board. That is an ethically concerned board maybe, but we can't say that that actually has the ethics expertise. And the results, when you look at the IRB decisions, the results show that. Um, what we want to do is not to turn everyone into ethics experts, but we provide, um, we do trainings to such a degree where whatever, whatever um, systems are in place, that functions well. So mm -hmm. if we are putting the, the box, our, one of our tools with these principles, if we are pr providing you that, we want to bring the people who are going to use that from the developer side in a, in a level of skills that they can engage with these questions. Um, they, they don't have to go all, all the way into country ethics to understand autonomy, but they understand what is agency and what is, a, what is a consent and all of those type of things. And build organizational network within the company so that there's an escalation process. If I think that now we are in the Kantian level of ethical complication, I stop as a developer and I just, reach out to the ethics team to give me a hand on this one because the question is clearly complex. Not every question is complex. In fact, a lot of the ethical issues arise because people don't think about the most basic questions, like what is the harm that this can bring? What is the value that this, this AI system adds to the problem that you are trying to solve? As, as, as elementary as this gets you quite a long level, you add to this simple tools, you already jump one more step ahead. And then once we hit proper dilemmas, yes, then we, we need the ethics experts. And I can tell you, since I started working in, in the field, um, now we have many, many more people and many more people are at, um, finishing their PhDs in the coming years and who will be skilled in, the, in, in dealing with this question. So building upon that, and then I go to Kafi also to reflect a little bit on, um, because I think what um, uh, Chansu uh, was saying is also, anyway, there has to be some kind of a business case for uh, uh, AI ethics. And, and my question to you, what's the business case for business ethics, right? Uh, uh, and, uh, and which, anyway, you rightly uh, identified as basically the foundation upon which then AI ethics can be built. But um, uh, you already mentioned Kant, uh, um, <laughs> uh, Chansu. So there's a question, anyway, uh, Alat, uh, and again, I'm probably mis uh, mispronouncing it, is eager to understand what philosophy classes uh, are needed, if any, right? Because that's a, a question is, right? Does everyone has to be a PhD in philosophy uh, in order to become uh, uh, ethical, uh, uh, responsible, right? But uh, over to you, Jansu, any, uh, besides Kant, anything else that you would recommend? <laughs> yeah. So I think, um, I think the question is really like, 
what is the goal, right? Because if, if you want to become an ethics expert, I would definitely say, yeah, go take the counting class. I mean, you need it, right? Like, actually, I would say for proper applied ethics, you have to understand moral philosophy and political philosophy. A lot of these questions are not even like, are not coming from the, the exact field of moral philosophy, but even coming, mostly coming from political philosophy because mm -hmm. they're trying to allocate resources and decide how this affects the fairness within the society, right? So definitely moral and political philosophy if you are gonna become an expert. Um, on, if, if the, this is about trying to um, get to a, to a level where you can engage with these uh, questions, um, applied ethics, uh, if this is the university, applied ethics classes are usually extremely useful to put the concepts into application. And um, I mean, applied ethics classes can be in many forms, you know, bioethics, business ethics, environmental ethics, all of which basically gives you the same sort of like the structured thinking and use of these concepts. Now, only thing you need to do if you don't have like a technology ethics or engineering ethics class at hand, um, to go ahead and understand the AI uh, terminology to sort of put them together. I'm sort of simplifying it because I don't know which angle the person wants to come from. But what I would say for um, any student is, th this is a question that is very often asked, like I wanna do AI ethics, what, what should I study? Mm -hmm. I would always say, you know, I don't think interdisciplinary, like landing in this, like if to do bioethics, landing on bioethics, or to do AI ethics, landing on AI ethics, I don't think that's the right way to go. I think you need to have a core understanding of a discipline. So become a philosopher, become an economist, become a uh, you know computer scientist, and build on this multidisciplinary way of working on top of that. Because if you know a little bit from everything, I don't think that is uh, that is enough. We have we can collaborate. If you're an expert, we can collaborate and bring that entire multidisciplinary uh, perspective better. So know a discipline really well and build on it. <laughs> great, great, great. Yeah, and, and we do a lot of work on anyway, the, the new kind of bilingualism that is needed. So you have to create this new kind of bilingual people that have actually domain expertise, but then uh, in addition, also have a certain kind of AI ethics expertise um but um over to you and again we could uh, talk about it. and, and nuria i actually also want to ask a question about that within the context of ellis in a second um you know given the fact that you anyway, have advanced this whole new area of phd kind of uh students um anyway where does ai ethics uh feature in all of that right but um uh javier what's the business case of business ethics from your point of view and why um uh, anyway um and, and, and here I specifically want to focus also on, because a lot of the AI um, applications, uh, anyway, obviously are established within uh, larger corporations and typically larger corporations have, anyway, that kind of um, culture, uh, 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 corporate culture established, but many are also emerging from startups where, anyway, it's really about survival. And, uh, and so the question then is, of course, anyway, how do you then uh, make the business case for entry business ethics when uh, really it's about, anyway, I, I need to do anything I can to survive the next year, for instance, and so as a startup. So over to you, Xavier. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, I fully agree 100% with, with Janso in the terms of I think the right way, you know, for some of the questions that were asked is the applied ethics approach just to to get trained okay and, and identify uh, some of the of the basic aspects uh, the second thing is uh, regarding the, the the case for for ethics uh, most companies we have interviewed you know in different research they are actually applying uh, at least in in Europe, they are following the the uh, AU uh, the, the European AA acts. Okay, mm -hmm. so they are basically basing the business case on the risk approach. They are mm -hmm. mapping the, all the applications, or at least that is the first stage of what they are doing. They are trying to to map uh, all the whatever number of application product services that might be using some sort of AI as, mm -hmm. as broad as it is, and then trying to map that to match that with the with the risk scale. Okay, mm -hmm. and then move from there with the use of, of, of frameworks, with the use of 
of questionnaires just to assess the risk. Like, I mean, the same way they do with any other risk assessment um, uh, procedure. And out of that, they build the, the business case. In the case of a startup, of course, it is different. And, and again, it's not that I want to, to, to deviate the conversation, but you know that in, in, in entrepreneurship, there is a specific set of, of business ethic challenges mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. related, as you mentioned, how mm -hmm. do I survive tomorrow? Uh, I think, and, and that's very key, because it is true that many new applications have been developed by, by some of these startups. And in that case, given the fact that they are very, you know, less people and, and sometimes they just, I don't know, I remember when we were doing uh, some, some of our research, we were interviewing some of these small startup AA companies and they were saying, well, you know, I have been asked by this company, private or public, that they needed, as, as Nuria was saying at the beginning, they needed to, to collect some, some data in an automatic way from, I don't know, web scrapping or just using this legacy database and, oh, you know, we've got thousands of, of data available. Yeah, but the problem is that someone will have to realize or, or someone will have to tell them that they cannot really use those, those data, right? So that's, that's truly a challenge. However, so also related with some of the questions, I think nowadays, and, and this is a good example, nowadays people are talking more about ethics than 20 years ago, okay? So I think, and also in more and more universities, in more and more business schools, in more and more educational institutions, the subject of ethics is being brought. So overall, I think the trend is going upwards. Um, today I'm optimistic. Great. Thank you so much. And um, oh, yeah, just Jansu and then uh, Nuria. And I do want to be sensitive to the time. Uh, so we have about three more minutes. But uh, Jansu, over to you. Very minor co mini comment on this yes. one. Um, with the, about the startups, I mean, obviously, this can't cover all startups, but something that I keep advocating, but so far there are no takers, uh, but I, I, I still try it, is that I think the ethics component should be added to the environment of the startup. So accelerators, you know, incubators. The, the, we can, through those resources, we can provide ethics consulting, we can help out a lot of startups. I'm still waiting one of those incubators, accelerators to start realizing this and take the lead, but you know, just to put the yeah. word one more time. <laughs> Yeah, no, and this is a topic, and again, if we have more time, um, is also the role of venture capitalists and, and investors, and, and, and to what extent should it come from there, right? But um, Nuria, last question for you, no pressure. Um, so um, you, of course, are anyway, behind Alice, and so tell me a little bit about yes, how you want... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> how you want to... Um, and again, we only have like two more minutes, but how do you want... How do you... Where does ethics fit within the vision of Ellis? Yeah, well, so there is um, so there is Ellis Europe, and then there is Ellis Alicante. So Ellis right. Europe is a very large association created by the machine learning scientists in Europe, and the goal is to contribute to Europe's technological sovereignty in AI by creating by changing the way research is done in Europe. So it is more competitive and it is more attractive to top talent because top talent is the talent that actually is not choosing right now to stay in Europe and is, you know, or, or is not working for European, you know, institutions. So Ellis Europe has a very clear European evidently focus. So um, being in Europe also means that we are aligned with the European vision of AI, which is the more human centric vision, you know, and so forth. Elis Alicante is one of 35 Elis units that there are right now in 14 European countries and Israel. Elis Alicante is special in the Elis network because it's the only Elis unit that has um, a legal entity as a nonprofit research foundation. And it is also special because it's the only Elis unit that has a clear purpose, which is uh, um, doing research on human-centric AI. Mm -hmm. So um, with the goal of 
uh, contributing to AI having positive societal impact. So in Alis Alicante, we have three big research areas, and one of them is um, the ethical implications of AI, um, mm -hmm. inventing you know, a new sort of like AI algorithms that have guarantees for non discrimination uh, that are transparent, that, um, uh, you know, that don't manipulate, you know, human behavior, that don't violate privacy, that there is also guarantees of veracity and so forth. So within Ellis Alicante is very prominent. In Ellis Europe, there is also an Ellis research program, which is another of the um, pillars of Ellis. In addition mm -hmm. to the units, there is the programs, the research programs, and there is one research program called human-centric machine learning, which I also, which I co-direct with with two other uh, directors, and it's a program that brings together top scientists from all over Europe, including non-computer scientists. For example, we mm -hmm. have several experts in ethics and in the law, and and the topic of this program is the intersection between um, um, ethics and machine learning methods. Yeah. Great. Wonderful. Well, it sets definitely a good teaser for anyone interested uh, on yes, uh, human centric. There Ellis. you go. So, uh, uh, but anyway, this was fabulous. And again, as always, an hour is way too short. Uh, but uh, um, I think we touched on a, a few a very important aspects. Um, and uh, Jansu, Xavier, Nuria, thanks so much for sharing your wisdom. Thanks also for sharing the module and for anyone who got teased uh, to actually learn more about what they were discussing, go to AI ethics course and uh, also go to the links that were shared uh, throughout the session as well. Thank you so much. And uh, this was recorded. So if you want to uh, uh, review and watch it again, it will be available on our website from uh, probably this afternoon or early Monday onwards. Thank you and have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.